Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of five in our new series on light. You might think it's simple, but it's not at all. We're gonna talk about how light affects humans, what it even is, the speed of light, and why that's important. We're even gonna talk about quantum computing and radio signals and all sorts of stuff. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube so you get all of our episodes in this and all our other series, or if you don't wanna wait for all the episodes to come out, go down into the description, click on the link, you'll go over to iTunes, and you can listen to this as a podcast, all squished into one. But let's get right into light, because this stuff is really crazy. I hope you got your thinking cap on. Light affects humans in so many different ways. You know, we couldn't pack all of the things that light does for and to us in one episode. So let's just look at some highlights, right? The very first time that humans created their own light, the first time we were able to take light and kind of use it as a tool was, of course, fire. It was as a light source. It's you know, makes us so we can explore dark caves. We can take it with us places. We can also protect ourselves from predators at night and ward off those things that go bump, if you will. Also, it's great for dancing ceremonies, I guess, but really it's more for social interaction after the sun goes down. It's much better to interact socially when you can see the other person you're trying to interact with. Over time, obviously, we eventually invented public lighting. The idea that everyone could share this light resource that the municipality created. Street lighting was first recorded in Antioch in ancient Greece in the fourth century. Pythagoras, who died in 475 BC, thought that light rays emerged from a person's eye and then hit an object and bounced back. Which, that's completely wrong, Pythagoras. Come on, man. Stick to your triangles. But Epicurus in 270 BC thought that objects were producing the light rays, which then traveled to the eye, which was also wrong. And other Greek philosophers like Euclid and Ptolemy, they thought that light bounced and bends as it passes through transparent mediums from one place to another, which is totally the closest thing that those ancient Greek philosophers could have without understanding what light is as, you know, particle or wave or whatever. We'll get to that. Electric lights were introduced in commercial application as early in our history as 1879. Edison took the viable incandescent light bulb and was able to sell it to the public. Now, at the time, they didn't last that long. They weren't very bright, and they were mostly used sparingly, to put it mildly. And some people would even just put it in their window to show off to other people that they could afford electric lights. Over the next 40 years, in the late 18, early 1900s, homes in urban America were moving into the early electric light adoption. And that meant all sorts of energy needed to be generated. We're not gonna talk about DC versus AC and all of those different things, go Tesla, but still, that had to happen to start using the electric light more widely. And once it did, we became, well, we became in need of energy efficiency because the early light bulbs weren't that efficient. By the time the United States entered World War II, we needed fluorescent lights. We needed more efficient light bulbs. In the 1930s, 10% of people in rural areas already had electricity in their homes. And by the 1960s, pretty much everybody had it in all their homes all over the place. With electric lights, people could work later hours. The workplace could stay lit. People could read more. They could socialize more. They could go out on the town because they had street lamps and people felt safer and more rural and what would probably be considered more sketchy areas before the electric light. And a steady rise in higher education enrollment was allowed because of that, because you could study at night. And this spurred the advancement of technologies. And essentially, because of light, we were able to do so much stuff because the day wasn't confined to when the sun was up. But every advancement is not without a drawback. Too much light, it turns out, can actually be harmful to humans. Light pollution is a serious issue, not just for nature. Obtrusive, excessive, or misdirected artificial light or light pollution causes ecosystem and plant and animal problems. Plants and animals aren't smart enough to understand that artificial light isn't the same as the sun, right? For a plant, it experiences light, and then that's that. It doesn't think about, where's that light coming from? So when you have artificial light, the plants that live near those artificial lights have to change. They have to adapt, or they just get screwed over. Migratory animals have the same problem. Nocturnal birds use the moon to navigate, and they also use the stars. But if light pollution blocks their views of those things, there's no way that they can do that. 
Sometimes whole flocks of birds would follow not the moon like they were supposed to, but end up following bright electric lights and disaster would strike. For example, in 1954, 50,000 birds died at Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia. They followed lights and crashed right into the ground. 10,000 birds did the same in 1981, but instead of the ground, they slammed into smokestacks of a flood-lit generating plant in Ontario, Canada. What happens is, these animals aren't smart enough to adapt to it quick enough, and they end up dying. Newly hatched turtles, sea turtles, they need the dark sky to be able to navigate. They orient themselves toward the sea using the stars, and when they have electric lights around, they end up walking toward town and away from the place that they need to go to survive. And it's not just living things, you know, it's not just animals and plants and even us. It's, it's also artificial things, you know. Astronomical research needs very dark places. So specifically spectroscopy, for example, which is where you take the spectra of an object. You split the light from a telescope into component colors, and using those colors can determine the chemical composition and temperature of whatever you're observing, so a distant galaxy or a transiting planet, etc. City lights mess up spectroscopy, which is why most spectroscopy happens in very dark places. Some observers have even given up looking at the sky to try and learn anything because of light pollution. It's really bad. We humans are also affected. Artificial light disrupts circadian rhythms. They drop the production of melanin, so you can't sleep as well, which you can watch our episodes on sleep if you want to know more about that. Studies of mice found that when exposed to unnatural patterns of light, they would develop problems related to cell division and transcription of genes. It would alter our DNA to be around too much light, which is a huge bummer. The thing is, how is it that something that seems so simple, it's around us all the time, can affect us so much? What even is this stuff flying around? Like, I can't touch it, I don't feel it, but it's definitely something, right? To find out more about that, you'll have to come back tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe to Test2 Plus, and let us know down in the comments if we missed anything that you think light pollution really affects because light pollution can be pretty serious. Thanks for watching, and I'm Trace, and we'll see you tomorrow.